Um, so I'm Jen Hoodie, and I am a student organizer from the University of Dayton. And um, my case study is encouraging sustainable fashion on a university campus. Um, before I begin, I would just like to thank everyone for watching, um, as well as I would like to thank Jill DeWitt, Emily Shanahan, um, Hannah Nicholas, um, who um, are other students from the university who I've been working with, as well as our um, professor advisor, um, Dr. Tony Talbot. And I would also like to thank Elizabeth Reed from um, Illinois State University. Um, she was also going to be presenting um, with me this evening. However, she unfortunately um, was no longer available tonight. Um, and so for this presentation, um, I'm going to talk about kind of what we do at the University of Dayton to encourage sustainable fashion. Um, and at UD, we do that by having um, clothing swaps. Um, so in this presentation, I will talk about, um, kind of just give a brief background. I'll go into more specifics on our clothing swaps. I'll go into some of the results and takeaways that we've gotten from this. And then I will also briefly touch on um, Fix It Fridays, which are um, what Illinois State University is doing on their campus. Um, so just a brief overview of um, and history about uh, fair trade at the University of Dayton. We became a fair trade designated university in 2016. Um, we have a fair ethical sustainable sourcing working group on campus, um, which is comprised of different faculty as well as a student representative. And they work to evaluate current and implement new fair trade initiatives and strategies on campus, um, and then to maintain and improve upon um, our fair trade designation. And then we also have a student-led fair trade coalition, uh, which is a student-run coalition. Um, and we focus on educating and spreading the word of fair trade on campus. Um, and we work to set up a variety of events around campus to kind of spread that awareness. And then we also really work to collaborate with other student organizations as well. Um, so just to kind of get started, uh, just a very brief overview of fast fashion. When you look at the fast fashion industry, there are um, a lot of different issues and that you can kind of look at either the environmental issues or the ethical issues. Um, and while you can split it up to that into those kind of two categories, they really both go hand in hand um, when you look at it um, because the env environmental cost of the fast fashion industry doesn't just impact the environment, but it also creates further injustices um, for various communities, um, especially for uh, the most vulnerable communities. And so there are a variety of initiatives that are um, kind of being taken to address these issues. And one way that individuals are taking action um, and really putting it in their own hands is by reusing clothing and buying secondhand uh, to reduce the demand and the support of the fast fashion industry. Um, and so the University of Dayton, we kind of wanted to bring that to campus. And so we decided to host our own clothing swaps. Um, so a clothing swap is an event where you um, collect um, clothes from a variety of individuals and then it's organized and then you put on an event to kind of display and put out all those clothes that were donated to the event and then people can pretty much just swap what they donated um, and see what other people donated as well. Um, and so it can create, um, it gives someone the opportunity to kind of revive and repurpose clothes that otherwise um, would have been thrown out. And so the purpose of this is to really encourage and educate about ethical and sustainable um, clothing and shopping habits. And so while the main um, kind of the main premise around this is swapping clothing, we also really work to make it an educational um, event as well. We were able to utilize a lot of the resources on the Fair Trade Campaign's website um, to kind of display information. We had a little kind of quizzes throughout the room that we um, completed this at. And it was really cool to see that people really did, um, they really were interested in learning more about it and not just going for the clothes itself, which is really neat. Um, and at this event, we also uh, provided fair trade coffee and chocolate to just once again, really promote fair trade um, to the students. Um, so who participates? Um, primarily since it is held on campus, it's mainly students. However, we really wanted to also um, Gate, um, engage with community members and just anyone else who was interested in the event. And so we decided to hold ours um, at a coffee shop that is actually um, located on our campus, just really make it easy for um, individuals to access um, and attend. 
And so for the process that we went through, the first kind of main point is to just educate um, the student body um, to get them aware of what, what it is, um, what it means and why it's important. Um, and then the second thing we do is we distribute bins around campus and that serves as kind of drop off locations for where um, individuals can donate clothes um, a week in advance. Um, and then the night before we pick up all those bins that are, um, are on campus to organize them and um, kind of we organize them based on article of clothing and size. So that way the night of the actual event, we can set it out um, and kind of make it like a, its own little shop. Um, and then throughout the night, um, people can just kind of come as they want and um, exchange clothes and pick up clothes that they see that they would like. And kind of the rule we've gone is just kind of the honor code. Um, we kind of just encourage people to kind of take however much they donated. And um, we've had really great success with that so far. And then a lot of people will donate clothes and then maybe not attend or just maybe pick up one thing. And so um, in the end, we are able to donate all the um, extra clothing, which is really awesome. And we just end up donating that to a local organization in our community. Um, so this past fall, we hosted um, a clothing swap and we had eight drop off locations around campus um, and we counted and we had over 300 articles of clothing that were donated for the event, which is really awesome. Uh, we got a great turnout. And um, out of everyone who attended the actual event, 80% um, actually did donate clothes um, and drop it off the week in, a week in advance. And so at our event, we um, decided we thought it would be a good idea if we could kind of gauge interest and um, kind of see why people attended, what their um, what knowledge kind of they already had. And so we decided that as people were leaving the event, we asked that they would fill out a Google form survey. And so from the survey, we learned that um, a lot of our attendees um, actually were um, at least somewhat familiar with fair trade. And then we also kind of asked them why they were interested um, or what they were interested in learning more about for the fast fashion industry, which you can see in um, the top um, pie chart. And the responses we saw were that 45% um, were interested in learning more about the environmental impact. Um, and so we really just kind of wanted to gauge that and really utilize this so that way when we host our next clothing swap, we can um, educate as much as possible and utilize the resources we have um, to spread awareness. And so from our clothing swaps, there are a few takeaways um, and tips that we got from this. Um, our number one tip is to partner with other organizations. For our clothing swap, we actually held it during our campus's sustainability week. So we were able to get a lot of support and promotion from that. Um, and I think that also kind of says a lot about kind of the survey responses was that a lot of people were interested in the environmental impact because I think a lot of people heard about it um, for, through um, sustainability week. Um, and so we also just are aiming to really partner with even more organizations um, on campus to really just expand our reach, which goes into our tip number two is to expand student and community reach. Um, so in terms of student reach, we next time we host this, we really want to um, engage as many students as possible and really try to reach um, individuals who maybe aren't already involved in a related organization, um, but really just the whole student body at large is kind of our next main goal. And we also really want to just um, get the community involved as well um, to connect students to the community, but also to spread that awareness of fair trade um, to the community and educate um, as many people as possible. And then our third tip is to create intentional engagement with volunteers and participants. Um, this especially goes for um, anybody who volunteered to have their house be a uh, drop-off location. We really want to aim to educate them about what the clothing shop is, why it's important, and um, to help them become someone who's interested and really engaged in the event and to help them promote it as well. Um, but then again, to really just kind of provide as much education as possible during the event to anybody that attends. And then our fourth tip that we came um, up with was to be on the lookout for extra loved clothes. I think a lot of times if they, you end up having a hole in a piece of clothing, you often just think, okay, that's that can just be um, thrown away. But we really want to encourage people to kind of see how it can be fixed and revived um, so that it doesn't end up in the landfill um, and that you don't end up having to go out and purchase um, something new. 
And so uh, to address this, we got inspiration from Patagonia's Warnware and we um, hosted a Warnware workshop where a local sewing collaborative came in and taught students how to sew and how they can fix some of their own clothes. Um, this was just kind of a very small event and we hope to build upon it in the future. And this is where um, Illinois State University's um, Fix It Fridays is what they kind of focus on. Um, I unfortunately don't have too much information. This is what um, Elizabeth Reed was going to speak on. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about this, um, you can visit their website um, to learn more. Um, so thank you very much for everyone who watched and um, I will hand it off to the next presenter. Okay, so I'm here talking about quinoa and talking about the future of the producers of quinoa in Bolivia, who are all fair trade producers, who I got to know because they were folks that I've worked with as a Fulbright scholar. Um, okay, I'm assuming that I'm live and I'm being heard because I don't see any indication otherwise. Okay. So, yeah, so I spent um, three years working with the women in Bolivia, um, working with the quinoa growers. I was a researcher. Um, I'm a professor. I'm an economist and also a business developer. So I was working on the theme of what's the future of the quinoa producers in Bolivia. And in doing the research, I discovered amazing things about these people and found, wow, this is really an amazing teaching tool that I want to be able to share with other people as well. So what I've done was I finished my study in 2018. And the last two years, I've spent really fine tuning some materials that I have. I have a book that I've written about sustainable development and how you can build sustainable development by using um, the business model canvas, which is a common business tool. Um, I created a game with it called using something I created called the sustainability lens. And what we're able to do is use all of these things together with the data from Bolivia so everybody can be engaging in their story and also seeing how they can make a real difference in people's lives as they're able to interact with the farmers themselves and with the different research and data I've collected. So let's go see what that all means. The agenda that I have for you guys is to introduce um, Perfect Seed Live Case Study. What is that? Um, it's a workshop, a project, a curricula, okay? It can be used in many different ways for colleges, universities, and clubs. It has an interdisciplinary focus, so other professors who are interested or just students who, are, who have majors in different areas. It works with communications, especially marketing, anthropology, and also economics. Um, it's based on the book that I wrote, Social Entrepreneurship entrepreneurship as sustainable development, which introduces the sustainability lens, which is a tool that you can use with any business to help make it more sustainable and resilient and fun and engaging. And it's looking at four areas, the resources, where you're, you're sourcing your products from, the health, what is the well-being of the people around you that you're working with, policy, what are the different rules and regulations and things that you support for your organization, for your consumers, for other people, and then exchange, kind of what we just saw, the clothing exchange, right? How are there other ways besides just um, pure monetary methods to be able to facilitate the um, sharing of goods and services? So putting all of these together, it's a lot of fun. And my book shows a lot of examples of how this has been done. Fair trade is a big part of it. And what I've done is I've created it into a board game with cards. I'm in the process of getting this more professionally produced. I have some grant money that I'm working with. Um, and this will be presented at the Academy of Management Conference in August. And it'll be ready for the fall of 2020. Okay, so we have this book, we have this curricula, we have this game, and then we have the content. Okay, so what I've done is by creating a live case study, I actually have a cooperative. I'm on the board of directors, and so are the quinoa growers, some of the farmers, and so are other academics and folks here in the United States. I work at Landmark College, so some of them are my peers at Landmark. And together, we've created this, um, this cooperative organization where students can actively engage in the social media, in the product sales, in the production of the farmers in educating consumers, creating new markets, reaching out to chefs, all different things. And what we've done is we've taken not just quinoa, 
but we've taken something called Kaslali quinoa. Here's my jar of Kaslali quinoa. It looks kind of different from other quinoa that you guys might be used to seeing and eating in the stores um, or restaurants. I don't know if you can really see, it's kind of a pink colored seed, but Kaslali quinoa is what the Bolivians use for making bread and cakes and cookies. And you do not have to mix it with any other product to make it a sticky flour. It already has that property. And there's many kinds of quinoas that have really specific culinary uses that nobody knows about. And I only know about it because of my three years of Fulbright research living in the communities with the most remote quinoa producers who are the fair trade, organic, hand-grown quinoa producers. So for example, with my students, we're gonna be doing a Kickstarter next month um, for perfect seed. We'll be creating social media. Other people can be doing this too. So this is how we're opening it up to classrooms. There's so many different varieties out there and nobody knows about them. So there's a huge amount of work that can get done. Caspina and Caslala are great for breads. Toledo is fantastic for soups. Chipi is really great for desserts and parfaits. Pandela is really good just as like a rice substitute on the side of your plate. And in the United States and other countries, we just take all of these varieties of quinoa, which wash out white, mix them all together and just eat them and say it's quinoa. And that's not the way it's eaten. And that's not the way it's grown out in the rural environments. So this is a whole new market, a whole new gourmet, really specific foodie oriented way of understanding and engaging with quinoa that is amazing. And what we're doing is we're putting it in your hands, students and professors, so you can start developing your own way of getting this information out there to the public. So we're working with platforms such as HubSpot Academy, and I provide you guys with curricula. So this is actually a package I'm offering. If people want to work with me, I have um, curricula and materials that go along with samples of the quinoa. So you can actually recreate this in your own classrooms or clubs. You can also do it individually. Um, we would open up our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter um, to everybody so that you can be using this for your own campaign. Um, so we have pretty open guidelines because part of our bylaws is to be able to have this educational exchange so folks can actually be working in a real life situation. Um, here, what we're doing is we're sharing stories. Okay, so again, by having the farmers be specifically a part of our board, um, we have direct access to them live in the field and they can be continuing to report and tell us about what's happening. Um, this all takes place in Bolivia. This is the most authentic original quinoa. It was grown on the, the shores of the Uyuni salt flats in South America. Um, it's hand planted and mountain grown. Okay, 30% of all of our quinoa actually comes from the mountains. Others come from the lowlands that are close to um, the salt flats that you see behind Megalina, who's also part of our project. Um, we have families, 3,000 families, and we have direct access to these families via social media and via the large cooperatives that they are all members of, again, that are certified fair trade. So really cool overlap there. We got fair trade, we have organic, um, and we have authentic original farmers uh, who are living on the shores, shores of the salt flats, and they're growing something called royal quinoa, which is only available in the salt flat region. It's a thicker, heavier more robust quinoa that's really absolutely delicious. Um, a lot of the quinoa is processed by hand. So here we see Miguel and Juana are, are processing their quinoa. Um, but then also they own, the farmers own sophisticated machinery to get the quinoa ready for export markets. So Apkisa is showing their equipment, but this is all owned by the producers themselves. So it's a really cool model showing solidarity. Why is this important? Because here's some of the academics on this. Okay, remember three years of Fulbright research. There was a quinoa boom in 2014, prices were high and it's crashed ever since. The current price of the market for quinoa does not cover the cost of the farmers in Bolivia who are hand growing this quinoa in very artisanal, um, culturally appropriate ways. And they can't compete with the mechanized quinoa that's coming from the rest of the world. So this project is also a way to help save their original lifestyle and enable them to still participate in world markets by competing with a product that nobody else has, these beautiful varieties of quinoa. I have data from a circle study that I've done with um, using the circles with sustainability model and the United Nations um, showing how people have really been um, having a hard time economically, 
okay, as this quinoa boom has taken place. So I have a lot of data that we can use for, for classroom information and also for social media. Okay, I've looked at the ecology, the politics, the culture, which is really robust, but people don't have market access. Even the organic fair trade price, which in 2017 was $2,600 for like a big container of quinoa, it doesn't cover the cost of the Bolivians for their production. You know, it covers the Peruvian cost, which is the same fair trade amount, but not the Bolivian cost. And that's because yields are lower, um, they grow it slower. It's just a completely different environment and product. And they really need to have that price be 25% more. What that 25% more looks like for the farmers is an extra quarter pretty much per big bag of quinoa. And for the consumer, it's an extra dollar a pound. So quinoa now is about $7 a pound, and we're looking at selling this quinoa, well, about $9 a pound retail, and we're looking at selling this about $12 a pound. So the way it works is we have the producers are right there in the organization, we have direct sales, wholesale, retail, and then we have classrooms right there working with the producers to help make all of this happen, okay? Once again, we have the sustainability lens book and curricula to help support this entire Free, offering for free for qualified classrooms a $500 value, samples of quinoa, a signed copy of the book, the actual game, and um, the curricula to be able to bring us to your classroom in the fall of 2020. So get in touch with me if you're interested in doing this more. Okay, my time is going off. I know we're done. <laughs> okay, but I'd be happy to work with you on this really awesome opportunity. So thank you. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Paige Ostrowski. I'm a junior at Michigan State um, and I'm excited to share with you um, how our student run uh, fair trade team at Michigan State navigates um, at a large university. So, all right, let's begin. Um, so first I wanted to give you a general feeling for the size of MSU. Um, we have just over 50,000 enrolled students um, we have the eighth largest college campus in the U.S. Uh, with little over 5,200 acres. Um, this includes 545 buildings, 32 miles of roads, um, and et cetera. Uh, we are also among the largest single campus housing systems in the country with 27 residence halls in five neighborhoods and three apartment communities. So with all of these residents, um, of course, we have a lot of places to eat including 32 campus outlets that provide food and drinks. Um, some of these are dining halls and others are cafes. Uh, one of our dining halls is Brody Cafeteria, which is the largest non-military cafeteria in the US. Um, so there's a great opportunity at a large university like Michigan State to increase the amount of products sold on campus, um, the amount of fair trade products sold on campus. Um, and the photo on the right just shows one product already available on campus, which is Ben and Jerry's. All right, um, and now I'll give you a brief introduction to our student organization, Fairtrade MSU. So Fairtrade MSU started three years ago um, as a team of two people, and we have had a varying club size since then. But this year, that number has remained consistently at six members um, and an advisor. Um, so again, this is a very small team. However, all of our members are highly dedicated and motivated. Uh, we all work together to help each other out. Um, over the past three years, we have held lots of educational events, partnered with other organizations on campus, um, and worked to introduce a new fair trade product to MSU, which I'll talk about more later. All right, so um, being at a large university, uh, it's been hard to make our voices heard at times. Um, and we've definitely faced challenges because of this. Um, one of our greatest challenges has been getting into contact with our school's catering. Um, we spent a good portion of our first semester this year just trying to get into contact with our school's catering in an effort to ask for more fair trade products to be available to students. Um, so we, the way we went about this at first was just Googling our school's catering and emailing around various people that we hoped would connect us to the people in charge of which products were sold. Um, however, we got almost no responses and nothing was helpful. Um, however, eventually we contacted one of our professors whose expertise is sustainable food systems. Uh, he used his connections to put us in contact with the executive director of culinary services um, and also someone who had previously worked to establish the first fair trade coffee at MSU. 
um, which is the fair trade Rwanda blend shown on the right. Um, so from this meeting that we had with them, we started the process of introducing new fair trade teas to campus. Uh, what we learned from this was to use your resources and find the appropriate outlet for your voice. Um, we had no clue who we should have been emailing and no connections to the director of culinary services, but by utilizing someone who knew us personally and had more connections than we did, we were successful. Um, so one big takeaway that we learned was to utilize your professors and advisors um, even if they aren't personally the solution, they may know someone who is and they want to see you succeed. Um, a second lesson we learned from this is to always try to improve upon something that is already established. Uh, because fair trade coffee flavors already exist at MSU, it was much easier to get our catering to agree to introduce fair trade teas. Um, and it's important to take advantage of what your university already offers, especially being a large one. Um, so now we'll talk about a second challenge we faced, um, and that was raising awareness and educating students on campus with limited people to do so. Uh, we wanted to host large events that could be attended by lots of people, uh, but we did not have the resources. So we partnered with other student organizations. Um, this gave us the opportunity to teach another student organization about fair trade while also being able to reach more people on campus. Um, and one of the great things about a large university is that there are so many other student clubs um, and a lot of them have shared interests to your own. Um, all right. And the specific group we were partnering, oh, I'll go back a second, sorry. All right, and the specific group we were partnering with um, is on the right and that was Spartan Global Development Fund. Um, so there's a photo of us with them there. Um, and their work pertains mostly to offering interest-free microloans to aspiring entrepreneurs in impoverished regions. So you can see the link between them and fair trade. Um, and that's why it was so great to be able to partner with them. Um, and if there was something we needed for an event we could not get ourselves, um, then they were often able to help us out. So that was another reason why partnering with them was so important for our success. Um, and then I also wanted to talk more about organizations and how they can be a really huge asset at a large university um, where there are so many of them. So one organization that has had a big impact on fair trade MSU is called RISE. Uh, RISE is a living learning program focused on sustainability and environmental stewardship. Uh, everyone who is an active member of our current team was once or is still a part of RISE. Um, last year, we specifically held meetings to teach about fair trade for freshmen in RISE. And by doing this, uh, we have not only received support from RISE in the form of scholarships to attend this conference in the past, uh, but we have also gained younger members who can help us to ensure lasting fair trade advocacy at MSU. Um, another example as to why partnering with other organizations is really helpful is they likely have plans already in existence that you can contribute to, but you don't have to be entirely responsible for. Um, an example of this for us uh, is our school's annual green gig. This is an event that occurs every Earth Day um, where all of the environmental and social justice clubs on campus, known as the Green Alliance, uh, get together and pass out goodies and flyers. Um, we also play a lot of games and just share a good time as a community of like-minded groups. Um, the best part about this event is our group does nothing to plan for it except to worry about our own table. Um, that's our table shown in the photo on the right. Um, so it is really helpful to take advantage of what is already in existence at a large school. Um, something I've learned is you don't always have to do all the work yourself. It can be really nice to align yourself with something that already exists. All right, and thank you so much for listening. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. So today I'm going to be talking about um, the social movement that I started on my campus, which is called Wear Justice. Um, I go to Point Loma Nazarene University in San Diego, California, which is a fairly small school, but San Diego is an interesting context because there's so many other colleges within it. So it's been a really cool opportunity to kind of use our small campus and the tight-knit community we have there and then partner with other schools. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about where, what Wear Justice is, how it's been successful and maybe some things you can implement at your own schools or churches or communities.
So basically, what is Wear Justice? Um, the tagline for Wear Justice is rethinking consumerism through community. So essentially, um, when I was a freshman in college, I was in a sociology class. It's my major is sociology. And um, we watched the True Cost documentary, and then we also watched the Story of Stuff video, which if any of you haven't seen those, those are really incredible resources. And so for the first time in my life, I had begun to think about ethical and sustainable consumption. And I began to reflect on my own values and the ways in which I was consuming and how that was maybe hurting people and the environment. Um, but I was just kind of given these resources and then not given any practical ways to bring that into my own life. So I tried to put my own goals on and be, be like, okay, I'm not going to buy any new clothes for a year. Or I'm only going to buy fair trade or things like that. And then I just found that they weren't really sustainable for me because I didn't have a community that was with me in that. So that's how I came up with Wear Justice is I wanted to kind of reflect on my own experience of learning about something that I really needed to learn about, but how that could have been, um, how that could have had more longevity in my own life had I had more of a community along with it. So I want to replicate that for other people. So this is a picture right here of um, Wear Justice this past year. This is just a section of the fair. Um, on the Friday of Wear Justice Week, we have a whole fair and it includes a bunch of different elements I'll talk about. So this is just like a little portion of it, but super fun. Um, so the context of Wear Justice is really important to talk about because as I said, Point Loma is a small university. It's under 3,000 undergraduates living on campus. And then um, my specific context was working with a nonprofit that's part of the university called the Center for Justice and Reconciliation. So my sophomore year um, in 2017, I was hired on by the Center for Justice and Reconciliation as an intern, and I was put in charge of planning the fair trade events um, for the semester. So we usually did a, um, for years and years before I was a student, they had a big um, Christmas gift fair. And so um, I helped plan that. And then in terms of planning that, I was thinking, okay, this is a great conversation, but the price point isn't really um, marketable to students at the university. Students aren't pur purchasing this stuff. And everyone here is really into fashion and really into clothing. So how can we talk about the fashion industry specifically? Um, so from that point, where Justice was created. Um, and we basically, it's gone on for two years now. The first year in 2018, um, we had lesser elements. And then in 2019, which is the year I'll mainly be focusing on, we kind of honed in on how we wanted to bring in um, education as well as ways to move forward. So this is um, an infographic talking about, oops, <laughs> talking about where Justice Week 2019 and the different elements we had. So um, we had what was called the Drink Justice Fair. And that's where we had um, different coffee shops that were ethical and sustainable from San Diego come and they offered free coffee to students and then students could vote on their favorite ethical coffee shop. So that was really fun. Um, we also had a booth every day on campus and people could donate clothes to the swap that I'll talk more about later. They could bring um, upcycled shirts by to make their own wear just a shirts, one of which I'm wearing right now. <laughs> and then they could also get chocolate grams um, that Tony's donated that would then raise money for the week. Um, we also had a fair trade film festival. In 2018, we showed the True Cost documentary. And then in 2019, we decided to do a mix of different short films and then have students speak about the ways that they were implementing um, sustainable practices into their lives. Um, we had a Ben and Jerry's donate. We had everybody get a free reusable straw. We had a Patagonia raffle. And then the Wear Justice Fair, which I'll go into much more, is our big kind of culminating event, the one that the picture was of earlier. And that includes a clothing swap, um, repairs by Patagonia, knitting and embroidery lessons, um, Patagonia raffle, all of this stuff. So that's just kind of an overview to give you a bit of a picture of what the insanity and fun of Wear Justice Week looks like. Okay, so moving on, um, the Wear Justice movement has three pillars that I've been focusing on through my studies as a sociology major that I've been learning about that I wanted to implement to make our movement successful and to make it sustainable. So the first is de-emphasizing the individual. The second is following the hierarchy of needs. And the third is education with community-based solutions. So I'm going to go into each of those a bit more. Um, let's see. So first of all, de-emphasizing the individual. This is something that is extremely important to me because I 
know and believe that United States is an incredibly individualistic culture. And I saw that happening a lot in our environmental movement, particularly. I remember it was sometime in my freshman year in college when um, plastic straws just became enemy number one. Um, and it was, there was, I just found that there was so much of a shaming conversation that was happening. And from my own experience, my own knowledge of how I've been motivated towards social change, I know that shame is not an element that makes us want to move forward. In fact, I um, was reading a, a psychological study, which I should have cited here, but on cognitive dissonance. And when there's something in our minds that challenges the way we've thought and believed, we often have the response to just get away from it and try and remove ourselves from it. So I'm really trying to combat that, that thing that's almost ingrained in us in wear justice. Um, so I really want to de-emphasize the individual and show that we're all in this together because um, like this first point, our buying patterns are culturally taught. Consumerism is something we're basically born into in the United States. And there's so many messages and there's so many things that are put onto us that so much of it, it takes a lot to separate ourselves from that. And then, like I already mentioned, when individuals feel shame for their buying patterns and don't have ways to change their lifestyle, um, they're really unmotivated to respond and often will just continue in the same patterns. So that was a big thing that I wanted to emphasize in where justice is basically saying, this is something we've been taught and therefore we have to really um, take some radical changes to detach ourselves from it and make it more about community than about individuals. Secondly, following the hierarchy of needs, um, I really believe with, uh, with fast fashion and the state we're at in terms of environmental degradation and how people are being treated, if we are going to um, reverse some of those damages, um, we need to act in a radically different way than we've been acting. So if any of you have seen this graphic, it's incredibly helpful. This is one that I actually drew, but it's based off of a graphic that I'm I've seen many times, but basically it's saying use what you have is kind of the most important thing that we can do following borrowing, swapping, thrifting, making, and then buying at the top. And I would say then um, buying fair trade and ethical, ethically made products. So this is something when I saw this, it was a really helpful visual for me. And I thought about it in my own life and my own consumption patterns all the time. So basically all of our events for Wear Justice follow this model really closely. And last of all, um, I want Wear Justice to follow um, education plus community-based solutions. So I do think that we really need to inform people on the state of um, environmental degradation and the abuses of human rights, um, because that's such a big thing that's happening within the fashion industry. And I don't think we need to shield people from that. I think people need to see the realities. But I do think, like I said before, that if we're going to tell people these really intense and really difficult things, we also need to pair that with motivation. And we also need to pair that with a community for people to use as outlets and resources in order to make changes in their lifestyle and um, fight against that idea of just like, let's shield ourselves from anything that's difficult. So that's why I really think it's important to pair education with community-based solutions. So there can be um, sustainable change that people implement in their lives. So those are the three pillars of the Wear Justice movement. So moving forward, um, the elements of Wear Justice Week, we have three main elements being swap, repair, and upcycle. So this especially takes place on the Friday, which is when we have the big um, Wear Justice Fair. So I'll show you all what that looks like. So swapping, um, it's been insane. It's so fun. We have this big main lane of campus and we've had thousands of clothing items come through the two years that we've done this. We made clothing racks this last year, as you can see, and it's just massive. Um, so many people bring so many different clothing items and people trade, and it's just so fun. And it's a great visual way to see um, that, you know, all of our closets are dynamic and we should be sharing with one another. And truly, even on just a small campus like PLNU, we have enough to keep everyone going clothing wise for a really long time. So to just see that of you don't need to buy new stuff because look at what we have all together if we pull our resources. I just love that. So cool. I've loved hearing that some of your other campuses are doing that as well. And second of all, we have repairs. As I mentioned earlier, we've um, been blessed to partner with Patagonia the past two years. So Patagonia's Wernwear Initiative has come to campus and they have um, set up their whole station and they've done all these repairs. So um that's been really cool. They'll repair mainly Patagonia clothing, but
but other clothing as well. So again, it's it's partially about the repairs, but it's partially also about the visual element of just seeing, hey, let's not throw things away um, just because, you know, they might have a problem. And then lastly, upcycling. This is one of my absolute favorite things. So in 2018, we um, basically had um, printed shirts from a fair trade company. But then in um, 2019, I wanted to focus more on upcycling with the products that we already had. So basically, we had a screen printing company come and they had our Wear Justice logo. And if students brought their own shirts, they would screen print them for only $2, which was really awesome. And it helped them cover the cost. And then way more people could have the Wear Justice shirts. And we knew that we weren't creating any extra burden um, environmentally by creating new shirts that people would potentially throw away. Um, and second of all, we had a bunch of student artists come. Um, we have a knitting club on campus. So that's what's being shown here is someone learning to knit. And then in the back, um, we had some embroidery lessons going on. So one of my favorite things to see was um, that people would go and grab things from the swap, like a jacket, and then they would go straight to the embroidery se session and then make their, their jacket that they just swapped their own, which I was like, that's so cool and so full circle and I love it and all of that. So it was really great to see that people were learning new skills related to clothing right there. So um, just to learn more, I know I just spit a bunch of information at you. Um, we're just, just week is super complex and there's so many different parts of it. So I have created a website um, as I do hope in the future to bring Wear Justice to other campuses because I do think it really has an incredible opportunity to be replicated and I think it could work well other places. So if you're interested in learning more, um, we have a video, we have a lot more information here. It's wearjustice.com. Um, so feel free to check that out and learn more. <clears throat> and then um, I can leave my contact information up for a second. Basically, if you have any questions or comments or um, want to email me about anything, or um, what's really cool is we have a team that's working on it. I'm actually taking a, a step back and because I want to make sure the event can be replicated and that because I'm graduating, I don't want the event to be attached to me. So we have younger students that are planning it this year. And so we've all been having a lot of conversations about what it looks like because where justice was meant to be March 30th through April 3rd. And now obviously that's not going to happen, but we're going to be doing a totally virtual where justice week. Um, so putting out a ton of educational materials. And then we're also going to be sending um, to students who are interested we're going to be sending Wear Justice swag bags of um, totes that people can decorate in their own homes. And then we're going to be sharing all that. And then we're going to be sending some Tony's chocolate to people. So kind of like, even though we're all in quarantine, we can do Wear Justice Week together and be pulling our resources and sharing about that. So if you're interested, feel free to follow the Instagram, PLNUCJR. And you can find a lot of educational materials that are going to be very general to everybody. We're also going to be really emphasizing um, how to support small businesses during this time because we know that small businesses are struggling a lot um, because of the lockdown. So anyways, thank you guys all so much. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out with any questions. All right. I'm going to turn my video off now. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> Um, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, my name is Enol Fulgencio. I am the current sustainability coordinator um, representing dining at the University of California, Irvine. Um, I'm actually joined here today with my sustainability associate, Jocelyn Sanchez. Um, she's sitting right across from me, um, tuning in with the rest of you all. Um, and we're really happy and fortunate to be a part of this panel today. Um, she's here to support me, but also to support any sort of questions that might come up during this presentation. Um, so make sure to jot those down and then um, save it for the end. Um, and so kind of just an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we'll start with um, student engagement. So kind of the ways in which we reach out to our students in terms of tabling um, and reaching a bunch of different students all across campus um, and how we talk about fair trade. Um, the second portion will be about campus partnerships, so how we've collaborated with housing um, and the initiatives that they've started to talk about um, fair trade with first and second years in their housing communities. And then finally, we'll be talking about sustainable procurement, so the ways in which um, we select the fair trade products that we provide on um, all of our dining locations on campus. And so beginning with student engagement, um, this is kind of just an overview of the current events that we um, go through every single year. 
um, most of which have been postponed due, due to the lockdown. But um, you'll see that a large chunk of our events kind of focus on zero waste. Um, that's currently the biggest challenge that we face here at UCI and probably a, alongside other campuses. Um, but we definitely do reserve um, sections of our events um, to other sustainable topics such as plant forward, plant based food, um, general dining, which typically covers um, every all the sustainable practices that um, we showcase here on campus, um, as well as um, fair trade, of course. And so kind of just to give you an, an idea of um, what we do um, in terms of fair trade, previously, um, we would have fair trade events. You'll actually see um, Lotus Pie in that image to the left. Um, she was our previous sustainability coordinator and actually presented at the fair trade conference last year. Um, maybe you were lucky enough to uh, go see her panel, which focused on um, SDG 12, um, which focuses on the um, sustainable um, production and consumption of goods. And so she was um, there talking about that. But um, in terms of her getting on board, uh, getting UCI on board um, to become a fair trade university, um, she would often reach out to fair trade vendors that we sold on campus. Um, providing those samples to students and then opening up the conversation about what fair trade is, what it supports, and then all the sort of fair trade ingredients that came in those samples. And so this essentially provided um, a backbone and kind of like the foundation um, as to how we handle our fair trade events now. But um, now with me and Jocelyn on board, um, we really want to take advantage of the opportunity to, um, you know, dive into deeper topics, um, see how fair trade as a concept um, taps into business and social responsibility, um, and then also creating interactive games um, that kind of discuss that fair trade, uh, fair trade education. Because when we associate um, our educational lessons with games, we often find that students can, you know, think back to the memories of when they either won or lost the game, um, but still taught, like can still refer back to that, um, to the messages that they were able to learn during that event. Um, also, in addition to that, we train a lot of our student leaders, so our interns, our fellows, our green captains, um, all of these are students, and so we have this sort of peer-to-peer -peer interaction when we're talking about fair trade. Um, it makes the environment a lot more comfortable when students can talk to other students about fair trade, and then we want to ensure that our student leaders are very confident. So whenever um, people approach our table and they have questions, um, our student leaders are confident enough to answer those questions. And so. Um, with that said about games, um, we've actually gone through two iterations. Um, we're quite happy with the second iteration that um, we've continued on with. Um, Jocelyn is actually the one to spearhead this new, um, this new game. Um, and essentially, we take um, six different products, all of which have different types of certifications on it, whether it's fair trade or not, um, and provide it to the student. From there, we kind of discuss what fair trade is or prompt the student to provide their definition um, and then also get them familiar with some of the logos that you'll see here on the right side. Um, these are just five of the many different certifications that people will see, but um, we chose the most popular ones and the ones that tend to appear on um, food products. And so um, students then um, will take away that list of fair trade logos. And then from that six products, they're able to um, separate which ones um, are supported by fair trade and which ones aren't. Um, and it can be challenging sometimes because, you know, there are a lot of certifications um, on different products. Um, some examples being like non-GMO, some items being gluten-free or vegan. Um, and so sometimes, you know, you have to often like read and, you know, an analyze um, the different products to see, you know, what actually is being supported by fair trade. And so um, with that game, you can kind of see on the left, um, uh, Naked Juice actually has two different types of certifications um, with um, it being um, certified by Rainforest Alliance. Um, and so with this game, we found a lot of strengths. Um, it first being fast paced. Um, our previous game was actually quite slow um, and would often create a line whenever we were um, boosting. And so um, that kind of caused um, a little bit of issues with that. But um, it, with this game, it still is thought provoking, even though it is um, quite quick to play. Um, it also dives into the overall concept of fair trade rather than a singular certification. So all the types of certifications that fall under the fair trade umbrella. Um, as well as um, students not needing to have a sort of foundation of knowledge. Um, but again, um, we were able to find that a lot of students already are familiar with fair trade. And so we're welcome to kind of open up the conversation more and talk about more deeper topics. So that kind of concludes um, the student engagement portion. Um, now moving on to campus partnerships. Um, just some background. Uh, we have two uh, communities on campus. I know that they look very similar, but um, both of our communities actually um, built um, towers at each of our communities. So I, I promise you, even though they look the same, they're totally different. Um, we have Mesa Court on the left and Middle Earth on the right, but we'll be focusing on Mesa Court more only because they tend to have a larger focus on sustainability. Um, 
one of which um, has a global sustainability themed house that houses um, 50 plus residents, um, as well as the initiative for a um, fair, fair trade uh, project in fall. And so, um, so the Mesa Court initiative um, entailed that all of the RAs would allocate 10% of their fair, uh, of their program budget. So anything regarding um, the budget that they would use to take their hall on trips, um, have programs for their hall, um, or uh, providing like snacks and stuff for for their um, hall mates, um, they would allocate 10% of that to um, fair trade products. And so when you crunch those numbers and do the math. Um, you'll see that um, they actually allocate $4,000 going towards fair trade products every single year. And so um, with that new initiative, something that we actually didn't even push on to them, um, it was something that they um, brainstormed all on their own. Um, we really wanted to come in and um, essentially support that, um, support that cause. And so by doing so, we wanted to make sure that um, one of their most recent events, um, being their Halloween events, um, they went to a pumpkin patch and then they also um, hosted their annual Haunt the Halls event. Um, we wanted to make sure that any candy that was being distributed during those events were 100% fair trade. Um, so we were happy to donate um, unreal chocolate as well as wholesome candies um, to essentially, you know, support them um, and show that like we are so proud of the initiatives that they're able to create. Um, and eventually that um, tied into creating a, um, a fair trade buying guide, which is a current project that we're working on with them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really great to work with um, different partners and expanding sort of like that education um, in both dining and housing. And then finally, moving on to sustainable procurement. Um, ever since May of 2018, um, UCI has been a fair trade designated university. Um, with that said, we've been taking advantage of providing a bunch of fair trade products all across our dining locations, as well as our on-campus bookstore. Um, and so you'll definitely see that a lot of our coffee and tea options are available at our residential dining halls as well as our retail locations. And um, you'll find more um, granola bars, juices, fruit snacks, anything like you can think of. Um, we'll have that more at our convenience stores. So a lot of fair trade products, um, a variety of them being more at our convenience stores. And so kind of just to like wrap up the ideas that we um, that we saw with um, reaching out to students via um, tabling events and then also our partnerships with um, housing. We're, I'm try, I'll try to condense it all into um, this last slide here, talking about the ways that um, we deal with product purchasing. Um, and so some tips for you all to take home with you um, when uh, you're on track to um, get your university designated fair trade. Um, the first tip that I can provide for you is learning about all types of fair trade certifications. So kind of thinking back to how we educate other students about learning their certifications, we also make sure that we know um, we can do the research and um, know what certifications are actually legitimate and um, avoid that sort of like greenwashing and making sure that all those certifications are um, actually legit. Um, and then the second tip that we would like to share is um, identifying the easy replacements at your university. Um, and by easy replacements, I mean anything from at your dining halls, you'll see like coffee and tea products. Um, that's an easy swap to make because we coffee and tea tends to have such a wide variety within fair trade. Um, and so taking taking away any non-fair trade options and putting those in um, is a really easy swap. Um, and essentially, um, even though students might not be familiar with fair trade, they're making a sustainable choice without even knowing. Um, so it's kind of just like the default choice. Um, for the third tip, um, make sure to find um, fair trade alternatives to popular products. So kind of like what I mentioned before about Unreal, um, that's an easy swap for peanut butter cups. Wholesome has a bunch of different types of candies as well that can um, replace a lot of other popular products. And maybe while not completely removing them from your convenience stores, it's really good to kind of just provide it um, to the, at the forefront so that students are able to like see products that they kind of recognize but are, have different brands and then they don't know um, any better to like that it, that it is actually fair trade but they eventually can pick it up and then um, we can educate them about it later. Um, as well as taking advantage of um, well-known fair trade brands. So um, fair trade brands like Naked Juice, um, Lara Bars are a really good um, fair trade brand that's very popular. Um, as well as um, the Yerba Mate brands, such as Yachok and Gayaki. Those are all very well-known fair trade brands that you can um, definitely implement in your convenience stores. And then finally, um, students and staff really love to explore their options. Um, we do definitely implement um, other brands that are not as well-known um, and snacks that might be just like a little bit different um, and a little bit out of other people's comfort zones. But by putting that 
um, at the front of the store, students often will kind of browse that aisle um, and then kind of see what other options are provided for them. Um, and I wholeheartedly believe that um, the first step that they can take um, towards purchasing more fair trade, fair trade items is to be exposed to them. And so, um, yeah, when students can kind of peruse and see the different options, um, and even though they might not um, like it at first, um, it still gives them the opportunity to check it out and try it. So those are some, um, some tips for product purchasing. And so kind of just to conclude and wrap up um, to expand fair trade on your campus, um, definitely take the first step to interact with students um, during like tabling events. I know most universities do have tabling events. Um, and so use that time to sort of create and brainstorm a game that students can often use. Um, if you want to contact Jocelyn or I, we'd be happy to share any sort of like templates um, and interactive material that you could use at your campus. Um, and then don't be afraid to dive into deeper topics during, during those moments because um, most students actually are familiar with fair trade already. So um, it's, it's good to take that opportunity to um, open up the discussion even more. Um, and then for our second um, point would be to definitely partner with any sort of um, department on campus that's already interested in fair trade. And if no department isn't, then definitely introduce it to them. Um, because a lot, um, a lot of people actually um, are interested in fair trade, but they just don't know where to get started. Um, and so I had mentioned the fair trade buying guide before, um, and that was something that was introduced to a lot of other housing communities besides um, Mesa Court so that they could also get kind of head, like get a head start on um, promoting more fair trade in their community. And then finally, for our last tip, um, make sure to explore and provide a variety of products on your campus. Um, again, uh, it's definitely all about exposure and then um, eventually educating those individuals on the products that are available and um, what, you, what they can do to um, support the cause of fair trade. And so that kind of concludes our presentation. Again, um, Jocelyn and my um, contacts are available here. Uh, feel free to provide any questions or comments. We're here to definitely support um, anyone who has um, any questions about the programs that we have. Um, and we really thank you for giving us this opportunity. Um, and so I'll pass this on to our next speaker. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for, for hanging in there for my part of the, my part of the presentation. Um, I'm going to be taking you through a um, look at a sustainability project, which, um, which is a project that's very, very near and dear to my heart and that of my family's. And the name of my presentation is called Cre Creating a Greener Coffee Footprint, Building La Chaparrala Wet Mill in Andes, Colombia, a Roaster and Farmer Co-op Partnership. And it's presented by Givinia Gourmet Coffee, which is my family's coffee company. Um, so I am your presenter today, Lisa Givinia Lopez. I'm part of the fourth generation of my family that's been in the coffee business. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little brief history on us in a moment. But I also work in the company. Um, at my role within the business is the executive marketing director. I am presenting with you, uh, you with Yu Yu Yen, who is our director of our of sustainability. She's going to be helping me field questions at the end during the Q and A. So please have some tough questions ready for her. She and she'll be ha happy to answer those um, when we get there. So first, a little bit of background on my family's business. My, my family has been in the coffee business for over 150 years. We actually started in the coffee business in 1870 in Cuba with my great grandfather. And um, so coffee for us really is a family tradition that began in 1870. And my family was in the coffee business in Cuba, Cuba for almost 100 years as both coffee growers and coffee roasters. And my family fled Castro's Cuba and settled in Los Angeles in the early 1960s. And this is where my grandparents started their lives over right here in Los Angeles. And they were able to get, luckily, get back into the coffee business in a very, very small and very humble way. But as coffee roasters, again, um, no longer growers in Los Angeles. And this year we celebrate 53 years of roasting coffee in Los Angeles under our Don Francisco's Coffee Cafe La Llave Espresso, and Gavinia Gourmet Coffee brands. And there you can see there's a picture of the, all the generations together on the bottom right. So our family, as a family, um, we, we like to say we are coffee-driven and sustainably minded. But what does that mean? Um, basically, because our roots literally are in the coffee farms in Cuba, um, we know the struggle of the coffee farmer. 
and we have a strong connection to the earth. And because the earth gives us coffee, it's our du- we've, we really believe that it's our duty to help preserve the planet for future gener- generations. We're a multi-generational family business. We want to stay a family business, and we're always thinking about um, preserving what we have or enhancing it for the next generation. And so a few years ago, our family initiated the Gavinia Direct Impact Initiative, which is our commitment to a greener coffee footprint. And under this initiative, we, um, we invest back into the coffee farms, uh, whether it's through technical farmer assistance or um, education programs in the coffee growing areas, we give back to the, to the coffee growing regions. We also operate a zero waste to landfill Field, sorry, zero waste to landfill um, roastery right here in Los Angeles. Um, so we're doing our part to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, we also source sustainable coffees such as Fair Trade USA coffees and USDA organic coffees, and we give back every year to over to over 300 global and local charities, whether it's an in-kind donations or coffee donations. So this is just an overview of our Giving You Direct Impact program. But the real cornerstone of the program is our dedication to farmers, where we invest back in our coffee growing communities. And as I mentioned in, um, early on, because we were coffee farmers, we have such a strong connection to the land. We understand the daily struggle of the coffee farmer. We also understand that coffee is just not sustainable without the coffee farmer. And that's why we invest back in origin. Um, so let's take a look at the typical day of the coffee farmer during the harvest season. So the harvest, coffee is an annual crop, and the harvest is usually between November to January or February, just depending on, on weather patterns. So it could be about, a um, what is that, a three to four month period. And during the harvest season, the days are very, very long for the coffee farmers. They're usually 14 to 16 hour days. And it starts on the screen from left to right. So you can see first, you know, first the, the farmer harvests the coffee cherries. And those coffee cherries, especially in countries like Colombia, have to be picked by hand and they have to be picked to ripe or else it impacts the, the quality of the coffee. So first you start with the harvest and that coffee has to be washed, separated, depulped and fermented, and then dry in the sun for seven to eight days. So that whole process is done by the farmer at their, at their farm at the local level, all on their own. And then they can they finally would sell their coffee to the dry mill after about um, nine or ten days. So from the time they harvest to the time that they sell the coffee, it, it, they would get paid about nine or ten days afterwards. And the impact of this, of course, there's social impact, which this is a very labor intensive process working this way. Then there's the, also the economic impact, which means that. You know, the, as I mentioned, the, the farmer is not receiving um, his or her payment for another from for nine to ten days from the time that the coffee is harvested, which creates cash flow issues for the farmer. And also, there is a ninety percent rejection. I'm sorry, a thirty percent rejection rate from the farmer selling their coffee um, in parchment. So what happens is, um, you know, some some of the coffee may not meet the quality standards that are needed. Um, you know. Um, something could have gone wrong in the processing, et cetera. So there is a 30% re- rejection rate basically of the farmer's entire crop that year. And then there's also the environmental impact. So when the farmer is wet milling their coffee in their home, they're consuming a lot of water and a lot of energy. Also that water is creating toxic waste from the wet milling because of basically with the water, you're removing the skin of the cherry on the coffee. And so, and, and there's like, you know, different, organic um, materials in there. And so with that water that's milled at the, at the home, it's released into the, into the uh, rivers, which is the main, you know, source of drinking water for the community. And also the waste, you know, that the, the skin that's removed from the coffee from the wet milling is either just land spread or disposed into the river, which further contaminates the river and the groundwater. So these are some of the impacts of milling the way that the, that um, coffee coffee is milled in many parts of Colombia, as we, we talked about before. But what if we reimagine this process? What if the coffee farmer could harvest his, his or her coffee cherries and get paid the same day, increase their cash flow, spend more time with their family, drink cleaner water, breathe fresher air, improve farming productivity, and minimize 
their, the impact of climate change? Well, it is possible and in introducing um, our La Chaparrala wet mill project. So this is a project that was done uh, in partnership with the Los Andes Cooperativa, which is a cooperative located in the Antioquia region of Colombia. Um, this, this project benefited over 800 coffee farms in a community of 20,000 people. It cost about five and a half million dollars with making it one of the biggest investments in the coffee agro industry in rural areas of Colombia. But with many, with a, with a commitment to bring many, many benefits to, the co to this coffee growing region, one being increasing the cash flow for the farmer, improving the quality of life, and also reducing the carbon footprint of this community. So here it is, this is a look at La Chaparrala wet mill, which is the largest wet mill in Colombia sustainably designed with innovative technologies. It's the most environmentally friendly wet mill in Latin America and maybe even the world, mostly because it has its own water waste treatment plant and also uses solar, and, uh, solar energy and coffee residue to create energy within the mill. Some of the project goals we have here are to increase consistent coffee quality by 30%. Uh, have um, almost half of the energy be produced by solar, leveraging that parchment waste to create like a biofuel to dry the coffee, employ an eco depulper to reduce the water usage by 85%, that's a huge number, and also treat 100% of the water waste to actual water um, drinking water standards before releasing it back into the community river and then composting the coffee waste and using it as fertilizer, so minimizing the overall waste and um, impact to the environment. So after the wet mill was built, it was actually inaugurated in December of 2018 and started operating in April 2019 after that um, late harvest or, you know, that's in 18 to 19. And basically, the the, the main difference of the mill for the coffee farmer was that it streamlined his or her process. Basically, the same day that they're, they're harvest, the farmer is able to harvest their cherries, they're dropping off their cherries at the wet mill. So they no longer have to wash the coffee, separate the coffee, put it through a fermentation process, and dry it. And the result of that is they're able to get paid on the same day that they harvest the cherries, which gives them a better quality of life more time to spend with their families, um, more time to tend to their farms or seek for their education, and also cleaner water and fresher air for them and for their community. And the results of the first year, we had 457 farmers participate. Most of them were members of the, of the Los Andes Co-op. We also, the mill also processed 10.7 million kilograms of coffee cherries, which became 2.3 million kilograms of parchment, and the water used per kilogram of parchment was 5.8 liters versus 40 liters per parchment kilogram before. That's that 85% um, percent reduction in water that we talked about before. So overall, this is excellent results, and you know we are working really closely with the people that are um, when are in partnership with the people that are operating the wet mill just to make sure that we track our progress versus our goals um, as we continue to move forward. So I hope you enjoyed learning about this project, La Chaparrala project brought to you um, by Gavinia. Um, we have a couple of videos that are, we're making available to you so you can actually hear from the far farmers themselves before the wet mill project and after the wet mill project um, and a little bit more about our sustainability projects. And I encourage you to Keep in touch with us. If you want to continue to follow our efforts on sustainability, you can visit our website, Gavina.com, or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or connect with us on LinkedIn. At Coffee Co. and at Don Francisco's are our handles. Also, we offer coffee for universities and colleges under our Don Francisco's brand, so don't feel shy to reach out or recommend our product. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christine. I am a junior at the University of California, Berkeley, and the director of the Coffee Conscious Coffee Festival. And it's a project developed by the Berkeley Anti-Trafficking Coalition. 
which is a group of students who aim to educate and inform the general public about traffic victims, which is not limited to the lucrative coffee industry, as um, in Lizette's presentation earlier. Um, so yeah, this is just a little bit about myself, my major, and like hobbies I do on the side. I big fan of research. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so around 125 million people worldwide consume coffee. Coffee is one of the world's most popular beverages, and 80% of it is produced by 25 million smallholders. It is the world's second most tra uh, tradable commodity after oil, which means that a lot of money is made for those who sell it, unfortunately not for those who grow the coffee beans. It is most valuable and widely traded um, um, and is mainly produced by smallholder farmers. Many of them, however, are unable to earn a reliable living from the coffee they produce, and we often turn a blind eye towards these labor injustices. Um, and this is my lovely team. We are sponsored by the Berkeley Anti-Trafficking Coalition and the Blum Center of Developing Economies, and they're amazing. We've worked this whole year to plan a coffee festival. However, it's going to be pushed off into the fall due to the coronavirus. But we've been working with many um, coffee shops, roasters, and ethical companies in order to create this festival. And so what does human trafficking look like in the coffee industry? Um, the main issue with coffee production is that there is not enough transparency of what happens overseas. On average, coffee farmers in developing countries receive only 10% of the retail price of the product. Coupled with this is competition that has led to price reductions that leave growers with no safety margin when the supply drops or when bad weather hits. Coffee is known for being a boom and bust commodity, and it varies from year to year due to weathering conditions. However, there is such a high demand for coffee that producers often cut the costs of labor in order to supply these demands. Um, the only leeway producers have is slashing the cost of farmers, uh, like the cost for farmers, because a lot of things such as fertilizer and water are fixed costs. And this is a huge concern, especially in regions that are affected by poverty, where vulnerable communities are more susceptible to exploitation. So this is a graph of the number of baristas per state, California being the highest with 60,940 baristas. So that shows that there's a lot of job opportunity and growth, and it's and like even the um, besides coffee production, um, consumption of coffee is a huge part of commercial capitalism. And then this is great for our economy, and this it and the high demand for coffee is an essential stimulus to our economy and the labor we produce. It is also expected that the coffee industry will continue to prosper and cultivate, as you can see, as of 2019, around 80 million um, uh, um, sales were made, and then we're going to have around 85 million at the end of 2020. Um, and then this is coffee imports in the United States in 2019 by country of origin. Colombia imports the most coffee in our domestic population. Many workers in the Central America are victims of labor trafficking, a less harsh term for human trafficking. The coffee industry violates human rights through its exploitation of migrant laborers and their children, and there's not a lot of job security in the coffee industry. Many farmers will live on the farms during harvest season and face harsh housing conditions, and they often have to live in like large buildings with multiple families. Um, child labor is also... Um, it's also a huge thing um, and it contributes to an extreme level of poverty in regions where coffee is farmed. For example, when the price of coffee increases in regions like the US, children from school are sent to work on these fields. But when the price of coffee also drops, poverty increases in these regions that depend on the sale of these crops and then children are still pulled out of school to work. Um, for example, in Brazil, workers earn less than 2% of the retail price of coffee and oftentimes, these um uh these laborers actually have no idea how much their coffee is being sold for um so this is the anatomy of a coffee bean it's a red cherry at first that becomes depulped and then roasted um there's actually so much caffeine in the fruit itself but um it's not really fda regulated so most of it becomes consumed by liquid um, and then how coffee is processed. So one of my members, um, Isabel, actually interned in Costa Rica, and she explains to me how this happened. This works. Um, natural coffee processing is when you wait for the fruit to dry and no water is used. It is the most fermented mode of coffee. And then honey is 
when coffee is dried with parchment and the rest of the cherry is removed. Anaerobic is when coffee is depulped and put into tanks. So there's a high pressure of carbon dioxide in the tank and then there's no oxygen. And this produces like a synthetic flavor. Uh, lastly, the wash method uses the most water, um, but it de is dependent on micronutrients and soil. The beans are fermented in water and dried in the sun. Um, and so the coffee industry depends on the labor of millions of workers who arrive on coffee farms during the harvest to pick coffee. The most effective way to ensure that these workers are compensated fairly is through a coffee cooperative. A coffee cooperative is a group of coffee producers cooperating to gain better access um, to resources, leveraging um, better marketing and business opportunities, and ha providing trading. Co-ops um, are have a great um, influence with fair trade coffee, and a worker owned co-op sources most of its coffee from small farmer cooperatives. Cooperatives are designed to deliver the consumer's dollar back to small scale farmers in poor countries and to address the imbalances of power. It's the coffee supply chain is arduous actually. It goes through the hands of growers, then traders, processors, um, exporters, roasters, retailers, until finally it reaches the consumer. And most farmers are unaware where the coffee is being distributed and how much it is being sold for. Cooperatives that establish fair trade relations are guaranteed to receive the minimum price of fair trade coffee, which helps to recover costs of production, even when there's like um, fluctuation in the cost of coffee beans. The consequences of being in a um, cooperative and fair trade is that there's more transparency um, with their labor efforts and addresses um, household and farming needs and establishes relationships amongst farmers who depend on the production of coffee for their livelihood. Um, traditionally, coffee beans are grown under a shaded canopy of trees and picked by local farmers, but um, modern methods of growing requires high outputs and is stripping away the sustainability of traditional growing methods. Canopy farming prohibits, um, provides habitats and ecosystems, but um, uh, the World Wildlife Fund reports that 2.5 million acres of forests in Central America have been cleared to make way for coffee farming, and 37 out of 50 countries in the world with the highest deforestation rates are also major coffee producers. Um, so these are examples of ethical sourcing labels. Um, six main labels, shade grown, direct trade, fair trade, USDA, organic, rain, forest alliance certified, UTZ certified and bird friendly. Shade grown means that coffee plants are grown under shaded trees to, in order to preserve biodiversity. Direct trade is when the roaster establishes a relationship with the farmer. Um, fair trade means that um, cooperatives deal directly with the retailers and get to sell their coffee at a valuable price. USDA organic means there's no synthetic pesticides in the past three years of inspection. And Rainforest Alliance focuses on environmental standards to encourage like eco-friendly business. UTZ is an ethically sourced label which aims to provide education for farmers. And Bird Friendly is a strict shade grown, um, which is meant to, again, um, help with the biodiversity of the environment. So our goal is to empower students with a resource to make informed consumption choices um, and support economically vulnerable communities, um, consequently minimizing the effects of labor trafficking and creating an, and we also created an interactive app that students can use at ethically sourced coffee shops in Berkeley uh, when purchasing ethically sourced coffee and um, the coffee shops with ethically sourced coffee will be present at the coffee festival and promote their own business. We have our own outreach team, which goes to different coffee shops and, and um, coffee roasters in order to talk about what is fair trade and what they, what kind of um, items they have that is fair trade to put onto our app. So we also create like direct relationships with these people. And this is just um, a highlight of what um, partnerships we had. Sweet Maria's is a coffee roaster and what our coffee festival looked like last year. That is Oski, our mascot, with um, a bunch of donations we got from like Equator, Rebel Coffee, Guayaki came as well. Um, and we have a social media team which communicates the idea of projects through Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. We also provide like education materials at our meetings, and we also provide it on our Instagram. Um, we had a crowdfunding campaign um, in order to um, um, pay for the cost of like uh, having reserving a space on our campus and we raised over a thousand dollars which was amazing our tech team is collaborating with political computer science at berkeley where we are further continuing to um, develop our conscious coffee app which is available on android and iphone 
Um, this is our app. We, um, it's called Conscious Coffee. If you guys want to download it, it shows um, the proximity to where we are from um, the uh, coffee that we want. And this is our coffee festival Instagram, Be Coffee Project, and our Facebook, our app, if you would, guys are interested. Um, this is just an example of networks that we've established. We have been in touch recently with Califia, Sweet Maria's 1951, which is a personal favorite. Um, yeah, just a lot of different coffee shops. This was our ad that we were going to have, um, and it was going to be free to all the students and staff and anyone who wanted to come. Um, and yeah, we will be pushing it to the fall, but it's been so fun, like, and incredible to do this kind of work. So yeah, this is, um, um, our platform and bye. Thank you so much.